here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week it's going to be the turn of the dictators because I recently spoke to their guitarist and songwriter Andy Chernoff to find out more about life, love, poetry and all that other groovy stuff. Anyway, this is the interview. So after several minutes of interesting but casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. Andy, it's over to you. Oh, um, the first band I recognized and fell in love with was the Four Seasons when I was a little kid, and they were all over the radio. And then my first favorite band was the Beach Boys. I love the Beach Boys. And I live in New York City, and I wished I was living in California. It seemed like, you know, the golden the golden land. Uh, and then, of course, the Beatles, they, they, you know... They changed everything for everybody in my age. Yes. You know, it's it was always, the and rock and roll was, was, was our lives. It did happen. I suppose you would have been about 10, 12 when they first started to appear on your television and on the airwaves, wasn't yes. it, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the I formative was... years. And were your parents at all, did they have any kind of direction or influence on your sort of musical world? Yeah, yeah. That my my mother's side was musical. My father's side was not musical. My mother's side, uh, uh, all played instruments, all sang. Uh, I was taking the first. My <laughs> my parents gave me uh, clarinet lessons when I was a kid. I hated it. I hated. It. I could not do it. Then I did piano lessons with uh, Arthur Friedman from the movie Capturing the Friedmans. You ever see the movie Capturing the Friedmans? That come out in England. Yes, <laughs> it's about a, uh, a a piano teacher who was accused of molesting children. He never yes, Captain. So great you movie. had great oh, movie. Yeah. So did uh, you have pia- did you have piano lessons with the the character from that film? Yes, right. Yes. He was my piano teacher, and and um, was he generally a good piano? Did he inspire you? Um. You know what? He this is he would give me sheet music. He, he first of all, he never tried to molest me, never tried to touch me or anything like that. Um he would give me sheet music and I would learn like some modern song, you know, from the mid 60s and I would come back and I would play it the way I heard it in my head, not the way it was written on the page. So he was, and I said, no, because you, you got it wrong. Because he, he had done it uh, by listening to the radio or something. So uh, I didn't last long. I'm not good with lessons and rehearsing. I know it wasn't my thing. I just wanted to pick it up on my own. And that's what, you know, what I eventually did more on guitar. Yes. You know, and but I always what... played, I was playing in my room, playing in my room. And then uh, one day... Ross Friedman comes to me and says, "Hey, I want to start a band. Uh, you want to be in it?" And I said, "Okay." And there, and I saw light at the end of my <laughs> light at the end of the tunnel for my life. Yeah. It, yes. It, and what sort yeah. of music did your mum used to listen to then? What was her song? Oh, they liked the Weavers. You know who the Weavers are? God, I'm struggling they, with in me. America. They, they were like a lefty uh, folk group, very right. traditional. Yeah, uh, they're worth checking out if you ever want to do that. They were listening to, oh, I remember Steve Lawrence, Edie Gourmet, uh, Show Tunes, My Fair Lady, Fiddler on the Roof. I remember hearing all that kind of stuff. Yes. I young. God, I, I remember Fiddler on the Roof. Did they like people like Teresa Brewer and those singers like Connie, um, God, what's his name? Connie somebody. You know, those kind of 50s, uh, 50s singers. That was sort of, Pardon? Connie Francis? Yes, that's it. No, my parents had no no connection with that kind of pop world. It was it was more of a straighter I think, but they you know, they they were they were they leaned left in their politics, so they they were listening to the Weavers, which was uh uh I don't know if you a little bit of history, but they were all accused of being communists. Right, the McCarthy period uh, then. Yeah, yes, in that period, yeah. Yeah. And did the and did the mafia have any influence or in, uh, impact on your life in New York during that sort of fifties and sixties period? Um, well, 
I'm Jewish. I'm not Italian. But I knew a lot of, there was a lot of mafia around. You saw them. But I never really interacted. Uh, but my favorite movie is Goodfellas. <laughs> oh, we do love those. That's one of our very, yes, interesting films, isn't it? Really? Yes, the Robert De Niro period. And uh, yes, Goodfellas. And uh, yes, obviously, we we sort of loved Taxi Driver and... Uh, oh, yeah. All those kind of films that we got. So, yeah, so when you got to 16, did you leave school or were you still sort of staying on to education? Because you would have, this would have been about 1966 at that stage, wouldn't it? Uh, oh, no. No, no, I, it would have been later. Got out of high school. It was in the 70s. Right. I went to college, uh, in upstate New York in a town called New Paltz State University. Uh, it was known for... Uh, being a kind of a party school, a lot of concerts, a lot of music. Uh, I saw some great, great concerts when I was in, in college. And that's when we we formed the, the band, The Dictators. And uh, um, so I, I dropped out. I never graduated, but I no. did. Did you, I mean, what was it like during that kind of golden period? You mentioned the Beach Boys. That was probably 66 they had their moment. And then 67 you had, you know, the Summer of Love and, you know, the Beatles were sort of doing Sergeant Pepper. And, you know, on the West Coast you had the gathering of the tribes at uh, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco with Tim mm. Leary and the Grateful Dead and Country Joe and the Fish. Did you, and in New York would have probably been very different, but you'd have had... You know, I suppose you'd have had certain other kind of experiences, either with, with it, whether it was the sort of, I don't know, the darker side of people like the Velvet Golden Underground, or you would have had some sort of awakening. The Velvet Underground, we love them so much. Um, well, all those bands, all those San Francisco bands played uh, the Fillmore East. I used to go to the Fillmore East. I saw them all. I liked them all at the time. Uh, New York had the Fugs. It had... Uh, Elephant's Memory, there were free concerts in Central Park, but it wasn't a real scene in New York until the New York Dolls came along. Right. And then, then all of a sudden, people, a lot of people were forming bands. Yes. And how, well, I'm 69, though, Woodstock, he says. Yeah. How did that, did, went to, you went to Woodstock? Yeah. And what was your kind of um, experience like? My experience was I saw every single band. I'm the only person. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else was out in their mud, you know. So I went there to see the music, and I saw all the bands. And uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it was I hate to say the term mind-blowing. It was kind of a mind-blowing experience. Everybody came out of that. You know, a lot of kids from my high school went there because it wasn't far away. It was an hour and a half, two hours away Yes, from where I grew up. And uh, it just gave everybody, put everybody in a beautiful hippie, you know, state of mind. It was it was a great experience. I I, I have I have a good memory of it. You know, it wasn't always pleasant. I wasn't you you weren't sleeping well. You weren't eating well, but uh, you knew it was a momentous experience. Yes, well, absolutely. And did you see a lot of the lesser known bands like the Incredible String Band or? Yes, yeah, they played. I liked I liked the Incredible String Band, their first record. I liked it a lot. Uh, the first guy I loved, I used to play that on guitar all the time. I think it's a brilliant song. Uh, I saw them at uh, Woodstock. Uh, that's the only time I saw them, but they they were pretty popular in America. Yes. At the time. And did you and did you stay for Hendrix on the Sunday? Yeah, there were maybe three five hundred people left that morning. <laughs> I, was, I was probably uh, 20 feet away from him. Yes. On, on the big stage, yeah. Well, that's amazing. And how did you, I know, just just curious, how did you cope with the rain when it all sort of gets into a bit of, a, you know, a battlefield? What was that like? Wow, I think I had a, a poncho. You know, I had a poncho, and I got I was separated from the friends I came up there with, and somehow I found shelter. I was never covered in mud you know um I, i'm pretty sure i had a poncho yes it saved did you ever think you were going to not get out of there or did was it always fine no it was all cool yeah it was great <laughs> 
God, that's 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 just amazing. I was, I was like, I was like, I don't know, was I seventeen years old, sixteen? I don't can't remember, but it was it was just a great experience, you know. It was the coming of the, the everybody you knew was there, and it was all these amazing bands. It was very exciting. Yes, well, I have to say they got the lineup right. I did see the other film. Um, Woodstock, the other film, but there was a film, um, there was another concert, wasn't there, sort of Woodstock 99. Woodstock, oh yeah, the, the, yeah, disasters, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of worth watching, but it does, even as a viewer, you do feel like, God, this is this is quite terrifying to, you know, it made a good, it was up, there were good fellas on, on sort of like, God, anything could happen, this is not good, is it, really? Um, yeah, yes. I, went, I, I don't go to big, I don't go to stadiums, I, I don't go to big concerts. No, absolutely. No, no, I don't either. It's just too much. But look, then, then 1970 comes along. Everything's going well. You're really there on the zeitgeist of this kind of great movement. But then, you know, Brian Jones has died. And then you get Hendrix, Morrison, Joplin all going. You had yeah. Altamont. 1970. You know, the, 1970. You know, the Manson murders, you know, yeah. bad drugs, bad acid, bad yeah. folk Altamont. getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go to Altamont, did you? I never met anybody. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Um, but what was it like as you, you know, as a, a teenager in the, the latter part of the teen period, which is still, you know, I mean, did you feel a little bit like, God, that's that's a bit of a downer? Um well it was a, it was a downer. It was sort of the end of the hippie area, and people went from LSD to speed and STP all these harmful drugs, but, uh, you know, rock and roll, there were other, there were things happening in rock and roll and rock and roll was influencing the culture at large. It was influencing how people dressed, how they wore their hair. Uh, what kind of, it was okay to take smoke pot again. It was okay, uh, to make love to, for a woman to make love to more guys than they used to be, you know? It was politics. It was anti-war. It was a powerful form of communication, which it is not anymore. But you felt that. And it was a great period for to experience uh, the power of music. Yes. Did you ever get worried about going to Vietnam? They ended the draft before I was eligible. Wow. Phew. Yeah, I got lucked out, really just lucked out by a year or two. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. quite a lot, lot of luck isn't it that would have been a game changer so then yes early 70s i mean obviously there's a whole new musical scene that happens and the band starts so did you at the beginning have a plan was there was there some idea in in place or was it the new york dolls that sort of shaped everything for you no um there wasn't a lot happening in america that was rock and roll Maybe there were some bands in Detroit, MC5, the Stooges, Alice Cooper, but it was kind of a moribund scene. There was a lot more action in England. And I was a big fan of Bowie, T Rex, Roxy Music, the Sweet, Mud, all those glammy bands. And a lot of them came over and I saw them here. And then the New York Dolls, right around that time, the New York Dolls formed. And they uh, reinvigorated the New York scene. And they were, everybody was forming bands. And it was, uh, everybody was trying to imitate the dolls. But nobody could. No. The dolls were unique. They had the charisma. They had the, the, you know, they say they didn't have chops. But I think they had pretty good chops. They knew, they knew their music. Everybody else just looked like retards. <laughs> versus the dolls. Now, my band, the Dictators, we formed in '73. We were we were more influenced by Detroit. Uh, we didn't really we didn't look so good in uh, us, uh, you know, satin pants and platforms. So we were wearing leather jackets and jeans and sneakers. And uh, we used to play this club called the Coventry in Queens. It was a glam club, and uh, there was a guy there who was always. You couldn't miss him because he was so tall. Joe Ramon, he went by the name Je Jeff Starship, and he used to wear, you know, satin pants and platforms, and he sang in a band called Sniper. Uh, you know, so we were we were doing the leather jacket, jeans, sneaker thing before uh, 
for the Ramones. Yes. And did you, were there bands like Blue Ash? Were they about at that stage as well? Yes. Yeah, they were there, but they're from Ohio. Right. So that's slightly a bit further over. But they had start, I think they'd begun around the same time, hadn't they? Yeah. They put their record out, it was on Mercury, about 71, 72, I would guess. Yes. Yeah. And that was, yeah, I think they were sort of also going through that sort of period as well. So then when, when the, Yes, because obviously, and did you see Bowie at that stage, his Ziggy Stardust? Had he sort of sort of played anywhere close to where you were? Yeah, I saw all his early tours. His first show was uh, Carnegie Hall, I believe it was uh, November of 1972. Then he played Radio City Music Hall, uh, February 14th, February 14th and 73. Uh, that was the Aladdin Insane tour. And then uh, he came again. He played in Madison Square Garden the next time for, um, I can't remember the record, whatever came after that. Yes, there you go. And there was a brilliant film a few years ago that came out, Danny Fields on on sort of the man, who, the legend that is Danny oh, yeah. Fields. Did you did you ever sort of bump into Danny at that stage? Because he'd sort of been such a all, mover and shaker. All the time. Oh, right. <laughs> We were, we were running around in the same circles. He managed the Ramones. The Ramones were friends of mine. Uh, we used to play together. Um, yeah, Danny. I'm not, I'm not my good friends with him, but we, we interacted. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. And what about experimental bands like Suicide? They would sort of obviously... Oh. <laughs> Suicide were known for clearing the room. <laughs> they were crazy. They were obnoxious. Alan was just, he would go in the audience and thing. But, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know Alan that. I met him later on. I think Alan was like the sweetest guy in the world, to be honest. I really do. Now, he was older. He was like a beatnik who became a hippie, who became <clears throat> a, uh, ex- a uh, I don't know, uh, a radical electronic musician, you know. Who was doing that kind of music before Suicide? There was nobody. They, they were the first electronic synthesizer band. Yes, absolutely. Um, Amazing, actually. Because I did an interview with J.J. French from Twisted Sister. I mean, it sounded from his story that they'd spent the entire 70s gigging, touring, playing dates all the time around New York. No one would give them a record deal. Did you also play a lot of live shows before you went into the studio for your first recording? Um, I just did JJ's podcast, by the way. We talked about all these same, the same early 70s era. Uh, did, did you see the movie about Twisted Sister? Yes. It goes up to when I think they get signed in on the right. tube. And the, whole, the whole movie is is them struggling. They get signed and the movie ends. Yes, that's the one I've seen. Great movie. great movie. Twisted Sister was making big bucks packing the clubs in Long Island Connecticut, New Jersey. They were booked four nights, five nights a week, and they were making tons of money. And bands that were playing CBGBs, uh, or, may, or maybe they had a record deal, but nobody was making the money because the system was it in those days. They were huge. I can't tell you how big they were. They were playing in front of a thousand people a night, and they were getting the whole door. The club would get the bar. They made tons of money because I know those guys. Right. And, yes. And they, they were very hardworking, very hardworking guys. Well, I could imagine playing virtually live all the time and still getting getting rejected. I suppose it's a bit like Meat Life as well. I remember his story and Jim Steinman would often feel like, you know, record companies would would almost set up another company just to reject them when they brought them brought them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard that he got rejected by every company twice. I, I did feel that. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, you know, you got to believe in yourself. You can't let the can't let the man get you down, as they used to say, right? Yes. And when and when did the I mean the punk period in New York hadn't when did that start to become more of a thing at CBGB's and Max's Kansas City? Seventy six. Seventy six. Right. So, but the, your first album came out seventy five, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. We we predated it a little bit. Or timing would, has always been off. My it you know. has. Well, I did an interview. I did an interview with a guy called Richard Strange in, in the you know from the UK, Doctors of Madness, and he said we were like two years. He said he was two years. The band were two years too 
early for punk, but everybody in the audience went on to form punk bands and were very successful. They just kind of were a little bit too, too ahead of their time. Did you feel a little bit the same that you were thinking, God, actually? Too young. I was very young. I was impatient. Uh, we didn't. We we got signed really before we played gigs. Uh, um, we we had. A, we had a house upstate New York in uh, this town called Grahanson, and we had invited uh, Sandy Perlman, who managed the Bloors, to, call, to come see the band. Yes. I don't know what the hell he saw. <laughs> we were horrible, but he liked us, and he brought us to New York. We made a demo, and we were assigned really quickly to Epic Records. Now, we made a record that was uh, completely impossible to market. But we did release our first record in uh, 75. And then, of course, a few months later, CBGB's opens, and there's an audience for us. The first time we played CBGB's, we sold it out. We had not been drawing any crowds. Uh, yes. And was it the case that you, you know, instantly became sort of, not the godfather, but the, the sort of the the kind of, yeah. the was the missing link between yeah. glitter and punk. Yeah. Yes. And what about bands what about bands like KISS? Were you kind of aware of them on your sort of radar? I saw them I saw them in they, they played the Coventry. I saw them play the Coventry. They were they were riding the glam movement more than we were. Uh but they were I thought they were pretty good starting out. I, you know, they seemed like they had good songs. Uh I went to elementary school with Johnny Thunders and Dictator's guitar player, Scott knew Ace. I think he, he went to college with him or something. He knew him. Uh, but uh, I like Kiss when I saw them in the club. You know, it would be, you know, their, their cheap outfits and their cheap tricks, it still seemed to work for me. Yes, I know. Because was it Desmond Child who did a, started writing certain hits for Kiss and then went on to Bon Jovi and those a lot of those big anthems we loved in the 80s. Desmond Child wrote uh, one of the biggest Kiss songs, which was a disco song. I was made for loving you, baby. Yes. He co-wrote that. I don't know if he wrote any other songs, but uh, that was later on, I think. that I'm not sure the year. That might have been 77, somewhere around. Because yeah, sure. on your because on your first album you do a couple of covers, don't you? I've got you, babe. But you also do yeah. California yeah. Sun, which is is that co-written by the famous Morris Levy? Uh, I think Morris Levy said I'll put it out if you put my name on it. <laughs> I <don't know> <laughs> wrote it. <laughs> I think his name was on it. But we did California Sun uh, a year before the Ramones uh, did it. Yeah, um, it just a song that we always loved. Yes. And did you have a manager at that stage? Was there any sort of um, advice that you were being given, being such young kids? Yeah, yeah. We were managed by Sandy Perlman, who was managing uh, the Bloors to Cult, and who was a writer for Crawdaddy magazine. He was he was a brilliant guy, absolutely brilliant. Right. He he managed. Well, he was one of the, he was he was <laughs> his intellect, he was like a philosophy major at Stony Brook. It was, you know, he 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 would he had his own he had a, uh, a secret language he would speak. <laughs> it, was, it was above my level. Yeah. Well, God, you know, it's always good to have some guide in hand, actually. Yeah. So yes. you had a couple of years before your second album, which was Manifest Destiny. Yes. What was it like for the band in after doing that sort of the, the first album where you put all your work into it and every everything you've got, and then you've got this kind of gap and you've got the the reviews and the some sometimes the disappointments if the album doesn't quite go as you planned. What was it like sort of bringing the second album together? Well, it... The, the failure of the first record was very depressing to me because I I uh, had put a lot of my heart into it when I was a kid. Uh, and so getting rejected, uh, it was tough. And I didn't handle it well. And I left the band. The band kept going. CBGB's is there. All of a sudden, there's an audience for the band. I rejoined the band. Uh, but I was playing keyboards, not 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 bass guitar. And we made a record, and I call this, we we decided, we made a record last time that's so uncommercial, we're going to make a record that's commercial, we're going to try to have success this time, and we're not really that kind of band, we're not really that kind of band. 
Um, I call Manifest Destiny the wrong record at the right time because when that was released, 1977, was when a lot of the great uh, CBGB's bands released great records like Talking Heads and Television. Uh, but uh, we got to make another record after that, which was a little more true to the sound that we more authentic of what I think we wanted to do, which is the third record, Blood Brothers. Yes. And you'd moved back, you'd been on bass, then keyboards, and then back on bass again. That's, yeah. You know, when I went back on bass, I think we really found our, our, our niche. And had you sort of obviously, you know, picked up on the the English kind of wave of, you know, the Sex Pistols, Buzzcocks, The Clash, Susan, The Banshees. Did they yeah, all yeah. sort of... We toured England. We toured England with the Stranglers in 77. Uh, we I was in England the week, the day the Sex Pistols record came out. And I, I met Billy Idol and, uh, you know, Mick Jones and Strummer and all, all the bands. We, we did Five Nights at the Roundhouse with... Uh, with the Stranglers, and we toured other around all Southern England with them, uh, and then we went to Europe, played the Europe on our own, headlining on our own. It was uh, it was a fantastic time to be in England. I was very much influenced by uh, by the scene there, which was much bigger than the scene in New York City and America. Yes. It was just a little sideshow, you know. No, nobody took the scene seriously, but in England. It's, you know, they're on TV, they're on the radio, it's hit records, it's, you know, everybody was a big star, and it was great music. So and I also, was, I always felt, as a sort of bit of a pop kid fan, you're always much more excited about bands further afield than anybody locally. And I know that, you know, I used to love John Peel, he was a DJ from the UK who was on Radio 1, but when he used to play any bands from America or Australia or anywhere in Europe, you'd always go, oh, wow, that's amazing. I will definitely love them more than if they had just been sort of lads down the road because somehow it always seemed a bit more exotic and everything, um, which does help as well. And also the UK is so tiny, isn't it? You've got to remember it's a tiny little place, but every city and town would have an alternative indie punk night and kids would just be very, very committed and very loyal. There was a very tribal quality to the UK, I think. Well, not only that, a lot of great music came. Yes, this is true. And I saw a really good documentary that was on the BBC when Blondie came to the, the UK. And again, that was the so, slightly similar story to what you mentioned, where they weren't really taken that seriously from this documentary in America and New York. But God, when, when they landed in the UK, it was like, wow. It was like, they were like, God, people love us. And they started in Bournemouth, of all places. But, you know, every city they went to, they were just literally adored. I think it was like, OK, we're we're quite a serious band. No one likes us back home, but they love us here. Well, same with the Ramones, you know. Uh, they were big in New York City. They could draw a few hundred people. But outside of New York, people, you know, didn't particularly care for them. And they go to England and they're playing uh, theatres. Yes, they're, they're treated like rock royalty. And Europe, yeah. how did you find tour in Europe? Was there any particular country? I find that often a, play, uh, a band will say, oh, yes, the Italians love us. Don't know why, but we're basically all Spain. But, you know, did you find one particular country that... Yes, <laughs> it would be Spain or Sweden. Matter of fact, uh, we just toured Spain, and it was fantastic. It was... Uh, the passion was uh, uh, overwhelming. Uh, so, yes, the country that dictators have connected in most is Spain. Yes, there you go. But they, good good on Spain. And the weather's nice as well, so there you go. So your album, Blood Brothers, this was one, 78, things are looking good for the band. But we're coming to the end of the decade, and obviously musical scenes change. You know, everything has about a year, two years before it all gets a bit sort of it becomes a bit cliched and embarrassing. What's it like for you in, in the band keeping it together? Because obviously you've been together now for quite a few years. Yeah. Well, we, 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 well, first of all, we, we, we had not really had any real success and our singer was, it was a drug addict. Uh, so it kind of fell apart at that point, you know, for, for a few years. And we, we from the UK, get this amazing idea from New York being sort of almost broke down on its knees. 
you know, a huge amount of poverty, but lots of very cheap spaces. But the birth of disco, punk, and also rap music. Did you feel any sort of um, that kind of, is it a kind of a romanticism when we sort of watch these documentaries and think, wow, New York must have been incredible. You had all these great art galleries, Andy Warhol, all these kind of cats hanging about. Um, I don't think I thought of it as romantic. I just thought of it as, well, we got a lot of scenes happening here, you know. Um, and I was I was aware of the rap scene early on. I was aware of the Jamaican rap scene. I used to buy uh, reggae records or guys used to, you know, rap over record uh, over you know uh, turntables all the time. So I was aware of the derivation of the rap scene and the hip hop scene. Um, and then disco. I, I don't know much about disco, but you know, you know, it was it was popular. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Did you um, did you ever go to Studio Fifty Four? Uh, I don't think so. No, no. Yes. So when your your lead singer left during seventy eight, uh, well, the band broke up. Band broke up, but the lead singer was was a drug addict, and it was impossible to really continue in that situation. So uh, we cut. Everybody kind of went their separate ways. Yes. So we with us in you know seventy nine, Thatcher gets in the Conservative government. Then there's we have the the Falkland War, the miners' crisis, lots of issues with the trade unions, and also there's Greenham Common. We think there's going to be a nuclear war. What's it like with you with Reagan at this stage in New York, with getting to a, the ripe age of twenty something and having no band, and suddenly another new decade to look at after sort of being around for a good mm-hmm. ten years. Uh, well, I remember the gas shortage, and they would uh, a lot super long lines for gas, and the Iran crisis where they had uh, um, took American uh, diplomats hostage in Iran. Uh, it was a little scary at time. There was a lot of inflation. It was an insecure time in New York. New York was falling apart. It was literally, uh, you know, just burnt out areas. Uh, uh, look like a, you know, look like Dresden parts of New York. Yes. But, uh, I was always involved in music. I would be working in studios. I would play with people. I wasn't, you know, making tons of money. But uh, I was always, I was still involved with music. Yeah. Did you get involved with people, places or go to places like the Mud Club? or? Yeah. Yeah. Th- those scenes as well and on the drug front having sort of interviewed quite a lot of people from new york it does sound like it's got pretty seedy at this stage did you manage to navigate your way out uh, away from that or did you have to sort of go through it yourself i i, I had a, like a, a certain pride that i could get through new york city i knew how to avoid getting mugged i was born and raised in new york city i had a street savvy that a lot of people came from out of New York, coming to New York, a lot of musicians came from other areas, coming to New York to, to, to make it. Uh, but the dictators and the Ramones uh, were, uh, and and uh, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers and Dolls, it was something about growing up in New York that, that enabled you to, to, to manipulate that all the danger and the drugs and, and the and the crime uh, that I was I was able to survive it without getting mugged and without getting killed and <laughs> yes so um, it was there and I had a certain pride that I was able to do that nice there you go there was a guy I think was his name Eugene Robinson who was in Oxbow I think one of those sort of bands quite a sort of fierce chap who sort of looked like he'd you know, was good on martial arts so he could sort of look after himself and navigate during that. I mean, in the 80s for us, I mean, there was that kind of the birth of, I suppose, the new romantic period and the Blitz kids, they call them. And then you had the goth scene that had really started. And then the post-punk world, then we had that kind of indie pop world with bands like the Smiths and obviously other bands like Echo and the Bunnymen, Simple Minds, U2. Did you... Did you sort of get that sort of coming through into your kind of consciousness and um, enjoyment? I was aware of them. I was aware of, I, I'm a big rock fan, always followed music. 
Uh, I wouldn't say I was as much of a fan of the Smiths as I was of, uh, you know, I liked harder music. I like pop music, you know. So I guess Smiths were pretty pop, you know. The Cure, you know, all these bands came through. I, I saw a lot of them. You know, at one point in the 80s, there were probably 20 rock clubs in New York City. So there were, there was a huge audience, and all the bands were coming through. There were a lot of people doing interesting things. It was a great, it was, a, you know, it was a good period of time. Yes, absolutely. And then you had the sort of the, the hair metal bands that came uh, up. Yeah. So how did you navigate that one? Did that sort of spike your interest or were you feeling a little bit more like... Well, I did the... a record that's a semi-hair he, semi band called the Wild Kingdom for MCA Records. Uh, and we, we actually, that's got a lot of airplay and some MTV, a lot of air, MTV play. Um, I wouldn't say I love the music, but that was what was happening then, and I did, um, you know, my heart wasn't into it, but but we did play in that style in that band, Wild Kingdom. Wild Kingdom. That came out on MCA in 1990. Yeah, it, it came out in, uh, I don't know, 1990, 1991, somewhere around there. Yes. But obviously then in the UK, I mean... You know, ecstasy appears in sort of late eighties. There's that dance scene, Chicago house music started, acid house. Then we had the Seattle grunge scene. So how did mm -hmm. you then navigate into another decade? Because there's always <laughs> I was uh, I was working in studios at that time. I was working in recording studios, and um, well, I liked Nirvana. I thought Nirvana was really, really, really great. A lot of the other Seattle bands, so so, but you know. It was scene after scene after scene coming, you know. I think maybe the the last big rock scene was probably uh, Seattle, you know. I mean, I there was a scene in New York after that with the Strokes and Interpol. Um, but the excitement level, it wasn't quite the excitement level because people were repeating ideas. Yes. That's uh, or to be original you know, 20 years down the line, you know. Um, but I, I was, you know, I've seen all the bands hanging out, having a good time. Because <laughs> during, the, your, you know, the 70s, you were a prolific kind of songwriter. Did you keep writing? And Yeah, I was writing. All the time. I was writing. Um, I had a few local people I played with. I would get a cover once in a while. I'd get in a movie once in a while, you know. Uh, so I, I, I was able to survive. Yes, absolutely. And did you, did you ever sort of want to get the dictators back at that stage, or was it sort of just put to one side for a bit longer? Well, we every few years somebody would say, "Hey, if you guys want to play the Ritz, we'll give you X thousand dollars," and we would do it. In 1995, uh, we played. We were asked to play CBGBs, played CBGBs, and there was a promoter from Spain at the show. And he goes, hey, do you want to come to Spain? And we go, yeah, let's go to Spain. We went to Spain. Next year, he goes, hey, why don't you come? I want you to come back in 1996. Motor in Sweden heard that we we're going to Spain. He says, what? I want to book you in Sweden uh, while you're in Europe. So we did that. And 97, we started getting more shows. New York, California, Europe. And... Uh, that's when I decided, hey, maybe we should make a record. Yes. So we spent the next few years playing and eventually released the record in, I think, 2021. I think it was the around the time of the World Trade Center. Uh, you know, we and we we did another record. And I, uh, my, maybe it's our best record. Even, you know, people don't know we talk about it. It's our best record. But I think it sounds the best. <laughs> I have to say it's got, um, yes, amazing cover as well. It's just a stunning album, isn't it, really? So Thank this you. is so you're, this is with your original vocalist as well? Yes, that was with the original singer, yes. Yes. And how did that, um, how did you cope with band dynamics and, and sort of personal bits and pieces? It was difficult. It was very difficult, you know. I eventually left the band. I didn't want to, I, did, I couldn't work with them, you know. It's... Uh, 
it's me. Um, and I did other things in uh, early 2000s. Uh, I played in some few other bands. I was uh, writing songs. I And then in uh, 2005, actually, I left the music business. I went into the wine business for, Excellent. for five years. Uh, and that was a great experience also. Yes. And then... Uh, if we're going through my so with just on the wine business does yeah. that mean you you buy a vineyard or you become a sort of a, mm-hmm. a tr- <laughs> what, what's the, what um i was always into wine when i was uh traveling over in europe i always like would stay later and go visit vineyards and i was always interested and um i was studying it was just like a hobby and then uh this guy i know said i'm opening a store and he had he used to work at uh danielle it's like daniel blue's uh, flagship restaurant and he won the james beard award for best sommelier so this is a great opportunity for me and i and i grabbed it so from 2005 to through 2010 uh i helped him open the store and uh and uh, you know i eventually left because my parents were, were getting old and very ill so I, I had to, I had to uh, keep an eye on them. But uh, I was doing less music in that time. So that was, in, I think in that period is when CBGB's closed. We played the final week. Dictators played the final weekend at CBGB's. Yes. 2006, I believe. 2006. So, uh, you know. And did, that, and did that feature Blondie on the bill as well? Yes, one night Blondie played. Yes, they played. Uh, I think it's Saturday night. We played Friday and Saturday. Saturday night Blondie played. I think they played acoustic. They weren't, you know. And uh, on Sunday, Patty Smith did the actual final show with CBGBs. My God, there you go, there you go. Did you have a lot of fond memories of CBGBs? Was that something? Oh, yeah. That... yeah, yeah. A lot. Of, I saw so many great shows. You know the. the... The amount of talent, I mean, when you think of television, the remote, talking heads, Make the Ville was a great, I mean, I think it was fantastic. I love Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Um, I'm missing people here. Uh, but what about lot- people What about people like Stiff Baters? Did you sort of come across Stiff? Oh, yeah, yeah. We know Dictators Dead Boys, we were buddies, you know. We played with them a number of times. I love Stiff. Very, very sweet guy, actually. Completely different from his stage persona. As that often is, but we 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 were, we were good buddies with the uh, Dead Boys, yeah. Yes, amazing. Yes, such a lot of talent actually. How did it compare to Max's Kansas City then, in terms of vibe? Uh, yeah, our bands would go back and forth. Dictators only played CBGBs because uh, our former singer had a riff with Wayne County, who was a who was a DJ at Max's. So there was a little problem there in those days. But uh, bands would go back and forth, play either. But I, I preferred CBGBs because it was, a, uh, it was a better sound system. It was a better place to see a band play. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yes, it's quite interesting because there's quite a rockabilly scene, wasn't there, as well, during that sort of, I don't know, the 80s. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, the Rock Cats were around. Um, the other band, Buzz and the Flyers. Um, I can't remember. But the did Rock you come, Did you come across the Rock Hats much and um, Lee Black Childers? Yeah, yeah. Every yeah, I across came across everybody. You know, yes, things were you know clubs and parties and things. There were these people around New York for a long time. Yeah. Yes. So after your your five years in the wine business, what happens to the next, the part, the last part of that, the decade of the the noughties, as we call them? Oh, after, uh, um, in in the from like uh, two thousand eleven on to two thousand nineteen, like in that area. That, yes. That, um, I was making solo records. I was making uh, videos. 
I was uh, licensing my music for for movies, TV shows, commercials. I was I was pretty lucrative period actually for me. And then in uh, 2019, uh, Ross, the guitar player for the Dictators, who's the, the man who heavy metal man of war guy, suggested to uh, me and Scott Kempner. Who formerly had the Dell Lords? I don't know if you're familiar with these bands. Yes, the Dell Lords. Yeah, uh, that we reformed the band, and that was sort of like the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing. But um, I was convinced by Scott, who was one of my best buddies, to give it a shot. Now, <laughs> two, I said this is around two, end of 2019. I said to the guys in the band, "Hey." After Christmas and New Year's, let's get rolling. So that's 2020. That's when the pandemic started. <laughs> so we reformed the band just as the pandemic pandemic was was kicking off and going crazy. And I'm, I'm pretty thankful that we did do it because it kept me busy in that period of time. And uh, and we've been going ever since. Uh, reformed band with. Uh, Abba Bouchard, who's from the Blur Skull. He's the guy who played the cowbell. Yes. On, on Reaper. There's, we, I don't know. we love the cowbell. <laughs> are you familiar with the Saturday Night Live sketch? In yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. You are. <laughs> um, and our new singer is this guy, Keith Roth. He's a DJ on uh, on Sirius Radio. He's uh, played with Cheetah uh, with Chrome, played with David Johansson. He's done a bunch of stuff. He's great. And we're about 95% through through uh, finishing off an album. Uh, we've been releasing songs, oh, you know, every six months or so. We're going to release a new song in February. Just trying to keep active. And yes. uh, it's been great. You know, we we played with The Damned in, in, in America. We played, we toured Spain. We go to Canada. We've done, you know, it's it's been, uh, you know, it's been pretty good reception for a reunited bunch of senior citizens <laughs> yes but you know, which is what we are we're really a bunch of old guys playing music so, well i know uh, but but you but also i mean you mentioned scott there who sort of encouraged the band to reform but then he sadly passes away with after dementia which is must be the most heartbreaking thing one could have ever witnessed yeah, pretty horrible pretty horrible uh we're gonna have a uh memorial on his birthday which is uh february 5th so we're going to do a few songs. A lot of people are going to get together. And uh, I see that you've got you've got another date very soon, the 5th of February at the Bar yeah. Bowery. And um, so this is, again, sort of the first of a... Have you got quite a few dates lined up for 2024? No, no, that's, that's, that's just for the Scott Memorial birthday party. That's a tribute to Scott. Right. So our, that's... our booking agent says, let's get the album out before he starts booking shows. So that's why we're scrambling to get the record finished as soon as we can. Yes. So with this single that I was listening to earlier today, is this a new material? Thank you and have a nice day. Is that a new yeah. release? <laughs> that, yeah, that was released in uh, September, I think. And we have another song coming out in February. We just put stuff out as we finish it, and, you know. You know, if you're in a band, you got to make music, you got to release records. That's what I believe bands do. Well, yes, absolutely. And um, Crazy Horses, this was last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can never, I know, because what I found with the pandemic is a lot of people went in their loft and sort of found archives of stuff and thought, I must get this sorted out. I've got nothing else doing. I'm stuck at home. I'm going to start sorting bits and pieces. Have you done that with your own sort of solo career and, you know, just musical journey as well? I did. I had a song called Born Hungry, which I finished and I did a video, uh, which was sitting around and I finally got it done. But we we were getting the dictators rolling just as a pandemic. So we recorded, as soon as we could get together, we, we recorded four songs, uh, which was uh, Crazy Horses, uh, Let's Get the Band Back Together, and Goddamn New York. And we've they've all released them. We've got some videos online. You know. 
Uh, but but now, now we're getting a little more serious because now we have a, a digital distributor and a company that's going to put out the vinyl and a booking agent and a manager. So it's you know uh, as as we progress as a band, we're getting more serious about um, treating it like a business. So we'll see what happens over the next. We year. we like I mean, and then you look at the think, oh, are we too old? And then you think. The Rolling Stones are in their 80s. You're still young. It's fine. But <laughs> it's always good so to I, know. This is the thing. Every day you make music is a good day. A good what am day. I going to do with this in my life? You know, as long as I'm healthy and when I can do it, I'm going to be making music. I'm not a, uh, I have no hits. I'm a working, I'm a working musician. Yes, absolutely. And it's also punk, interestingly, has become, you know, there's there's kind of various, the Rebellion Festival, which takes place in the UK. But then you've also got in Las Vegas, you've got the punk bowling weekend in the end of May. But also you've got this museum that's uh, suddenly appeared in Vegas um, about a year ago. So punk and people's curiosity of punk has kind of been absolutely sort of a lot of new kids have enjoying it. Obviously, the people who were there were enjoying it at the beginning um have you sort of also been tapping into that kind of world as well of people you know the curiosity that was you know all the cbgb's mud club the ritz all those things has that sort of given the band a little bit more of a higher profile uh i think that people know the name of the band and they check us out um but i think it's it's really going to kick in we'll find out more over the next year after we get our record out, we'll see how people really react to the band. Right now, it's um, we're just on the fringes of the of music business. But um, since we have other people working with us now, we'll see how it how it all impacts. Yes, I, and we, you know, yeah, I'm aware of rebellion. I'm aware of the uh, the, the Vegas thing. We raspate the Vegas thing. But we're not taking every show now. We, the focus is on getting the record done. And it takes a long time because we trade files. It's a whole different way of recording. We're never in the same room. Get, we may be in the same room together a little bit, but for the most part, you know, uh, we have a drum. Uh, the drummer records his drums electronically. The guitar player plays it in his friend's studio. I play the bass. Everybody sends me the tracks. I organize it. We we maybe we'll get together. We'll do some background vocals. It's a very long, tedious process. It's not like you go into the studio, you play, and you come out with with, with music. It's back and forth and back and forth. And what takes ten minutes in a studio will take two weeks trading files. But right. It's the only- it's the only way we could we could we could do it now. It's not my my favorite way of doing it, but uh, it allows us to do it um, without any big expenses and without you know you know every schedule is you know we're adults. It's hard to get the schedules <laughs> coincide. It's really really difficult. Yes, you'd probably have more luck getting four planets to line up in the galaxy. Than exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's you, there's Ross, there's Keith, there's Albert on drums. Are you all then sort of scattered over America and you've just got to, um, yes, coordinate this? We're scattered, and, and... We're scattered over the uh, uh, tri-state area. I'm upstate right. New York. Oh, so that's not too bad. Yeah. No, we're not, we're, not, we're not that far. We can get together, but we're not, you know, I'm, I'm upstate New York. Right, Jersey. Uh, Ross and Albert are in Queens, New York, in New York City. Yes. So, so uh, who? So who's the one? Who's the producer of the the kind of recordings at this stage? It's mostly me. Mostly right. Me. Yeah, everybody, but everybody contributes. You know, everybody's got a lot of experience. Yes, absolutely. And obviously, been so. Are all the songs written by you? By the way. Uh, most were written by me. Keith has made some contributions. Ross, Ross wrote me and Ross. Ross and I wrote uh, "Thank You" and "Have a Nice Day." Uh, Albert has a song he wrote by himself. Uh, maybe actually two songs he wrote by himself. We're doing a, also we're doing a cover of a Bloors called song. Oh, which one? Trans. It's called Transmini Con MC. It was on the very very first record. Uh, I think it's a great tune and. Um, so 
it's you know it's been great i mean i i, I love recording with these guys it's been a lot of fun a lot of laughs and uh it's a good creative interaction which yes. is healthy well, it's, it keeps the mind. I do, I have to say, Blue Oyster Cult were one of those bands from my youth. My brother, who was seven years older than me, had quite an interest in record collection. He was very into prog rock, which I thought at the time was brilliant. But he also loved, you know, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath. There was Blue Oyster Cult. And there was a great song, uh, Is It Burning For You by Blue Oyster Cult that had the great time to have time to play B-sides. I always thought that was right. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. well, that was know. Richard Meltzer wrote those lyrics. He, he, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a great line. And with you, with writing, do you sort of have to sit down and really think, right, I'm going to put a shift in, or do you keep a notebook and then think, ah, oh, right, I've got some ideas coming? How does it work? Is it a methodical way or is it quite spontaneous? You know, I've been doing it for 50 years, and uh, it's always different. I've written songs in my head. I've written songs that have taken a year to finish off the song. Um, the the ideas don't flow as quickly as they used to, but I think we got um I think we got a lot of good songs, and uh, I'm anxious to hear what people think of them. You know, it's it's certainly not not contemporary what we're doing. We're doing '70s rock, you know. So we'll see if people have interest in that. You know, it's not modern at all. It's not like the modern pop stuff. And, you know, you know, I, I, I listen to Spotify and you see people I never heard of and they got 300 million plays, you know, and my favorite band has 100,000. My favorite song by some obscure band has 100,000 plays on Spotify. So, uh, you know, the business is completely different. But, it's a very uh, different piece. But then, you know, as Lemmy from Motorhead used to say when he walked on, we are Motorhead and we play rock and roll. I don't think right. it ever dies, does it really? Um, it, it won't. I don't know. I don't think it'll die, but it certainly is not the cultural force it was when I was in yes. the 60s. It doesn't influence politics, doesn't influence art, fashion like it used to. No. I think the, one of the key things, though, and I don't know if you've noticed, you must have, but the, it's kind of often to do with the production, the producer, the kind of the... So the 80s production seems to date really badly, you know, it was like... Oh, yes. Like, yes. The 60s... Well, the, and, well, like the snare, the gate, they used to think called the gated snare sound. They would, they would they use a gated reverb on the snare, and now it sounds, it sounds so phony, it sounds so processed, it sounds uh, inauthentic. Yes. Yeah. It's it makes it not, makes you feel a little bit like, oh, I must get some fresh air. This is too much. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. Do you have you ever been? I mean, with your kind of archives and and probably memoirs, have you ever sort of had a temptation to write any to write your book to do do some sort of way of being able to document your musical life? Because obviously, you have done you know a whole career in music. Well, I, I'm not. I sold a lot of my archives. Um, I still have some here. I think you can see some, right? Yes. And here in these boxes here, and I have a room over there with stuff. But I sold a lot of stuff. It was just taking a room. I was, at the time, I was in an apartment, so I was renting space. I was spending money on it. I don't even, you know, the stuff I never look at. For, I haven't looked at it since I put it in this room here 20 years ago. So uh, do I want to write a book um not really no no i mean if you if you could have whispered something to your like 16 year old self starting now and you thought oh yes that would have been a good thing to have focused on or that would have been a good thing to avoid is there anything in particular that springs to mind that you would have um nudged nudged your younger self in not terribly but just a little I think I would have, I would have told myself just believe in yourself, you know, and, and uh, not. Uh, I, I, there are times I lost confidence, you know, and I just I think I would have been more encouraging. But uh, the fact that I've had a career in music, I find pretty standing, and I feel I'm very lucky. And every day I make I you know my my mantra is every day you make music is a good day. Yes. Uh, I'm a guy who's made music almost every single day in my life. It's been a blessing. Absolute blessing. 
Yes. Well, the, I don't think you would get to, you know, that point where you think, God, you know, I really re regret making music. You might regret all those no, meetings. No, no. <laughs> Never. You no, know, I, like, I, used to me once, like, I have friends who, and they got kids and they're, they're, they're like, hey, should I buy him a guitar? They, they, he wants to write songs. Said, Absolutely. You'll never regret having your kid making music. Maybe he doesn't make a living from it. The pleasure he will get from making music will encompass, in fact, every part of his life. Yes, absolutely. And with your sort of knowledge of that kind of scene in, in New York during the 70s and 80s, are there any bands that you think, oh, they were really good, but unbelievably they just never made it you know because there's always a few people aren't there that you think oh no one's ever heard of that band is there anybody in particular that you kind of no, i always thought mink deville had this had the chops to to be a, a a big star now when i first time i saw blondie i said oh my god they had no chance and of course they became huge and they and they became uh they made great records so i uh, you know you don't know you don't know you know, I saw the Ramones. I thought they were great, but with, did I think they were going to change the world like they did? I don't know. You don't know. You know, you just accept it. You enjoy the band you like. Um, you know, it's it's you know, it's been a great trip. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview. A massive thank you to Andy Chernoff for giving me the time for that. Of the dictators, I'll give you a link to his website below and or in the notes. It's basically andyshernoff.com. This has been the C86 Show. I'm David Eastor. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just do C86 Show. All these interviews have been archived on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. So if you want them, they're all there and much more. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.